Well, good evening and many thanks for allowing me to be part of your Sunday evening this evening and thanks to the friends at Galston who've invited me to share a short message from the Bible this evening and uh, I would like to turn to the beginning of one of the great uh, New Testament books, the Gospel According to Luke and it's Luke's uh, ambition to share something of the great and good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, a life-changing message, a message that has transformed his life and the life of many people that he knows, and a, a message that he has seen work in lives that have been marked by disaster and despair and discouragement, darkness and the very depths of sorrow and depravity. And Luke has seen those lives being touched by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and utterly and dramatically transformed. And so Luke shares with us the great news of Jesus Christ. And we're going to break into the first chapter of Luke's interesting account of the very beginnings of uh, the events that today we refer to as Christianity, the time when it all began uh, with the uh, appearance of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, into this world. So Luke chapter 1 and verse 26 says, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what kind of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And we do look to God to bless his word to us this evening. So remarkable events here at the beginning of Luke's Gospel. And I'm sure that we might reasonably anticipate that if God was to do something as dramatic and something as great as uh, coming into the world that he made, then there would be an expectation that God would highlight this to us. That, it, that the, the birth of his son, the incarnation of deity into this world would not go unnoticed. He, in a sense, would draw a red line under it. He would highlight it for us. He would draw our attention uh, to the incarnation of his son, Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what happens here in Luke chapter number one. As you uh, look at this birth, which by natural means and reasons ought to be completely unremarkable. It's uh, uh, another birth 2,000 years ago uh, in poverty to a, a relatively poor couple there uh, in obscurity. They don't have titles, they don't have place, they don't have position, position or possessions. They don't have any great political influence and they have a child. And by, by rights, none of us today should know anything about that. If this was just a, an ordinary everyday event, it would have died off into obscurity. And yet it is out of that unassuming uh, uh, ground comes the person of Jesus Christ and today because of the tremendous events that surround the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ we have all heard today of Mary and Joseph and their son Jesus uh, that is spoken of in this section. Now, so that we don't miss the significance of what God is doing back then 2,000 years ago God surrounds the birth of Jesus Christ with some real highlights, some pointers to say, look, I want you to take really special attention to what is happening here uh, in this uh, town of, of Nazareth. I want you to notice that the birth of, of, of this uh, child is, is, is extraordinary. And so uh, God sends an angel, uh, Gabriel, to highlight the uh, extraordinary nature of of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has this uh, un, uh, this uh, completely extraordinary announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus. 
And Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. This, you see, would be a supernatural birth. And uh, to mark that supernatural birth, there's this angelic announcement uh, announcing the incarnation of the Lord Jesus. But more than that, as you look at the setting of the birth of the Lord Jesus, you find that it's not only announced in a sense by an angelic messenger, but it has also been announced for thousands of years, in fact, by the Old Testament scripture. The birth of this individual here in Luke chapter number one is the fulfillment of careful planning. Careful planning that you and I can trace uh, this evening, right the way through the Old Testament scriptures. Careful planning that you can see that, that God has been laying down uh, year upon year uh, the expectation of the coming of his son Jesus Christ. And so you could, uh, you could anticipate the events of Luke chapter number one. You would know, for example, that when God would send his son, according to Isaiah in chapter number seven, that it would be a virgin that would conceive and bring forth a son. And they would call his name Emmanuel. That is God with us. And so that prophecy is fulfilled here in Luke chapter number one. You could go beyond that though too. And you could go to the book of Micah and find that not only would they be born to a virgin, but you would find the place where Messiah would be born. And in fact, of course, uh, the Jewish rabbis and teachers uh, recognise that uh, elsewhere in the New Testament in Matthew's Gospel, that there would be this little insignificant town, it would seem, called Bethlehem. And out of Bethlehem, there would be one who would... Who, who, who would come forth, who would always have been there. His goings forth would have been from eternity. And so you've got the place of his birth and here you've got the means of his birth by a virgin. And of course, if you were to go elsewhere in the Old Testament scripture, again, God was carefully setting down the plans and purposes in prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and you would find uh, the the uh, expectation and the means and the reason for his death uh, right the way through the Old Testament scripture. Uh, for example, in Isaiah chapter number 53, you would find that he would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity, our sin. And the suffering of our peace would be upon him. And by his stripes, uh, we would be healed. And that by knowing him, by trusting him, that that unique individual, that righteous servant, would make many right, for he would bear the sins of many. And so through the Old Testament scriptures, not only do you have in a sense a one-off angelic announcement that here is my son uh, to Mary, but actually perhaps for of greater significance to you and I today uh, in uh, 2021 in Scotland, we can look back and we can see, you know, the announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus wasn't just dependent upon one angel to, to Mary uh, or even an angel to Joseph, but rather we can see it with our own eyes. We can read it ourselves there in, in the book of Micah and there in the book of Isaiah chapter 7, there uh, in his is his the expectation of his crucifixion in Isaiah 53, there in his sufferings in Psalm 22, and his resurrection, in fact, in Psalm 16, that he would he would die, he would be put in the grave, but he would not see corruption, and he would be shown uh, the path of eternal life. And uh, we would see uh, right the way through the Old Testament scripture that God was going to do something great and something glorious. Uh, and you would find all of that plan and purpose, even even little glimpses from the miracles of the Lord Jesus there in the Old Testament scriptures and even in fact the very time of his death you would read there in the book of Daniel and so we have here in this wonderful section here in Luke chapter number one the unique purpose uh, for which the Lord Jesus Christ would come he would be born of the virgin announced by the angel a unique purpose set apart from Ordinary humanity in the sense that he was sinless humanity, a sinless individual who was set apart for this unique purpose that he might bear my sin on the cross at Calvary. Uh, and he was an individual who uh, had, had a, a, in a sense, he was backed up by a set of unique proofs. Uh, a whole set of Old Testament books that had been written all about his coming before his incarnation into this world. A, a unique set of proofs that pointed forward to the unique and the special individual that Jesus Christ is. That he is the eternal son of God. Don't miss him. 
says Isaiah. Don't miss him, says David in the Psalms. Don't miss him, says Daniel in his prophecy. Don't miss him, says Micah. And don't miss him, says Luke here in his great gospel, uh, Luke chapter number one. Because you see, all of our hopes for, for time and the, the very uh, uh, joy of our life now is dependent upon knowing the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's utterly unique. A unique he has a unique, a unique purpose, a set of unique proofs. And more than that, uh, he is indeed an utterly unique person. And uh, if you have that, let me just highlight the kind of person that he is here uh, towards the end of that little section. Uh, Luke chapter number 1 and verse number uh, 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He's a unique person. Uh, I want you to appreciate, uh, says the angel to Mary, that the one that you're going to give birth to is going to be king. Now that's great. And he indeed one day will be king. And perhaps some of us can remember that there was a special cruel insult uh, that was thrown at the Lord Jesus as he was crucified on the cross at Calvary. Uh, and above him was put that name, King of the Jews. The, really, the Roman authorities were mocking his claim. They were mocking even the nation of Israel. Here's your king. Look at what we've done to your king. And yet there was a lot of truth, in fact, in that statement because he, he is indeed the King of the Jews. And one day he will be uh, the uh, claim of throne. He is the son of David. He's king. But, but more than that, he's the son of God. And you get, you've got that twice in a sense in that section here. He's the son of the highest in verse 32. He's the son of God in verse 35. But I don't want to particularly highlight either of those two great uh, titles, as great as they are uh, for us this evening. But I'd love just to leave us with this one very simple thought. That not only is he a king and not only is he God, but uh, there is this wonderful title that is announced and given uh, to the son of Mary. And it is there in verse 31, thou shalt call his name Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's a wonderful name. Um, there's a God in heaven and perhaps he might seem distant, far away. Maybe we have a suspicion that that God in heaven did something that affected our life. Maybe he's responsible for creation, perhaps. And perhaps we might blame him at times for events, good or bad, in the world. And we've got a suspicion that there is someone or something out there. There's a God, but we really don't know him. We, we, we really can't tell you very much about him. And he seems distant and far, far away from us. Well, God has done something utterly remarkable in his son. That the God who may seem so infinitely far away from us has come uh, so close to us. Uh, so close, in fact, that he has been born into this world. And born for a unique purpose that is revealed here in the name of his son, Jesus. Literally, that name means God saves, Jehovah saves. And in this son of Mary, uh, not only is he uh, unique in his purpose and not only is there this set of unique proofs about him, but he's, he has a, a, a unique, uh, he is a unique person. Because you see, at the beginning of this great gospel, as, as Luke sets out God's plan and purpose for the world, as, God's, as Luke sets out the God's answer to our need as, as men and women, he, he points us to not a method or a religion or, or anything like that, but he, he points us to, to a person, Jesus Christ. In other words, says Luke, in other words, says the Bible, God's answer to your need and my need, God's answer to our need forever and for now is a son, is his son, our saviour, Jesus Christ. And that to know that saviour, the Lord Jesus, is to come into the benefit and the blessings of what God has for us. To come in simple faith to Jesus Christ is to enjoy what God has for us now and forever. For in his son, God had set forth his plan, a plan of salvation, a plan of bringing back men and women like me and like you to himself, to bring back people that did not know him, people that perhaps had a suspicion he was there, but we, we fell infinitely far away from him. He was cold and he was distant because of that separation that comes between us and God because of our sin. And in Jesus Christ, God had set out his plan and his purpose 
for dealing with that distance that there is between us, that sin that separates between us and God. In dealing with that sin that brings upon us the judgment of God and the despair of life and uh, the brokenness of our own existence. It brings about the sadness and the, and the sorrows and the tears and the heartache of our life. That brokenness and separation from the God who is love, who is light and who is life. And in this child that Mary would bring into the world, in this child is uh, not only God and, and the future king, but in this child is our saviour. And Luke is really asking, in a sense, uh, uh, as the question as we, as we go through uh, this great gospel of Luke, you know, have a look at Jesus Christ and have a look at what he has done for men and women. L take a look and see how he has, he has he's cleansed the leopard and how he has made uh, uh, the blind to be able to see. And, and take a look at how he's, he's, he's raised the dead and, and take a look at how he's fed the hungry and, and take a look at how he has calm the seas and to how he's brought back sanity to the insane and how he's cast out demons. But do you know him? Have you met him? Has he transformed your life? H has he brought you into a living, fresh relationship with God? Have you trusted him as your Lord and Saviour? Take a look at his cross as you come towards the end of Luke's Gospel. Take a look at his sufferings. Take a look at the fact that whilst others that died with him died as a, as a right punishment for their sins, he did not die for his sins. He died for the sins of those men and those women who one day would trust him as their Lord and Saviour. Do you know him? Do you trust him? And so Luke introduces the person of the Lord Jesus as I am trying uh, this evening to do. And he presents the Lord Jesus Christ as one with an utterly unique purpose. And one with utterly unique proofs. And one who is an utterly unique person. A person that you and I must know. And must trust, uh, for he is God's answer to our great problem, our great problem of brokenness, of sin, of an end that ultimately will be eternal separation from God. And God has done that in a person, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Have you trusted him? Believe, says the apostle, believe on the Lord Jesus. Believe in Jesus and you shall be saved. Many thanks for allowing me to be part of your Sunday evening this evening. Thank you.